All right, welcome in. This is the Front Row Podcast with Coach Mark Godfrey, and I've got to give a shout out to my producer, Murphy Cargus, who was the uh, bass guitarist in the band Sugar Ray. This is his song, Nate. How about that? Is that unbelievable? Huh? That's pretty cool. <laughs> so today I've got Nate Oates, the head basketball coach at Alabama, and I'm a huge fan and uh, extremely proud. Everybody knows my background. I played at Alabama, was the head coach there for 11 years, and now uh, the program is just in great shape. So um, so thrilled, Nate, to have you on. And uh, how you doing? Doing good. We we had our guys here just just over a week. Uh, uh, and not everybody's here, you right. know, like Darion Reed, one of our players playing on team USA and, but it's good to get the guys. I mean, you know, it's a little different than when you were here, you can work with the guys in the summer a little more, you get you guys here all summer. So it's, it's kind of refreshing to get a new team. I, we had, you know, a great run last year. We think we got a chance to making another great run this year. So get the guys on campus, start working. And as you know, there's a lot, lots of golf in Alabama too, but I, uh, I had a little golf cart accident. My my daughter tipped over our golf cart. My oh. my foot's a little messed up. I, I got I'm I'm going through rehab right now on my foot, oh, so I can't funny. get out on the uh, the nice course in Tuscaloosa that I heard you used to. Uh, you you were a good golfer from my I, well. I, I stink. Yeah, there, no, there's a lot of there's a lot of balls in the woods that are mine. If they if they have my initials, they're probably in the woods or in the water. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, Nate, let's go back because I'm always curious with everybody and I'm always interested. And, uh, you know, a lot of people know you. I, I know you and have followed you and all that. And, and like I said, really proud of you. But, you know, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, you getting into coaching. Was it always something you wanted to do or, you know, kind of after college? Like, like, like walk me through how you got started in coaching. Well, it was a little bit different than you. You uh we're actually a real player. You know, I believe got drafted. If I'm correct, I uh, I was I, I was a Division three player, and, and love I love basketball. So right about early high school, when I figured I was never gonna make money playing basketball, I figured the next best thing to do was to coach it. If I couldn't play it for a living, so I I remember and and it was like junior high. I think I bought like the Pistol Pete, all four of those, like his homework basketball, and then that Rick Patino had. Like his coaching tapes out. I think in like ninth grade, I bought Patino's coaching tapes. And should I, I'm kind of been, you know, you go through moves and you got to pack your boxes. I'm like, why do I keep moving these VHS tapes from one one house to the next? I don't even have a VHS uh, recorder anymore <laughs> to play them. But I, I, uh, so early high school, I kind of figured I was never going to, you know, be a good enough player to make money playing. So let, let's figure out how to be a good coach. So I kind of, Right kind of then through high school, I started studying it. I tried to work some camps through college. I used to work five-star all the time and tried to shoot my dad's guy's PhD in theology. He's a professor at Maranatha Baptist where I went to school. So I didn't really have any ends. My my college coach is a great guy. You know, I, I love playing for him, but he didn't really have any ends. He was never, you know, so I kind of had to make my own hmm. connections, if you will. And I just kind of hustled and went to some – Camps in the summer was Division three assistant. I went from where I played at Maranatha for a few years. I went to uh, University of Wisconsin Whitewater for a couple of years, and then I was fortunate. I got the uh, head job at Romulus. One of my teammates was from Detroit. He was back teaching at Romulus. A guy by the name of Ed Horn, and he. I never planned to go to high school. I was trying to stay in college and try to work up if possible. And I, I Ed kind of talked me into applying for the job. I went out there. I, I liked it, and I took the job on a whim. It was like, I was going to make $42,000 at Romulus and I was teaching. I was like, a, <laughs> I was not a full-time assistant at Whitewater. I was making $37,000 as a high school teacher at uh, Watertown High in the city. I grew up while I was coaching at Whitewater and I got a big jump. I was going to make 42,000 my first year at Romulus. And you could get to the top of the teacher's salary in 10 years at Romulus. And it took like 20 years at Watertown and I kind of liked the guys. They had a kid, Ron Coleman, that was, ironically enough, he was from Alabama, but his mother had sent him up to live with his uncle at Romulus, and he had two years left, and he was committed to Michigan. So it's like we got some talent in Romulus. They'd had four guys playing the NBA, Terry Mills, mm. John Long, Grant Long, you know. So I took the job. I ended up being there 11 years. Uh, 
kind of Detroit's kind of where I cut my teeth in coaching. And then next thing you knew, I Bobby Hurley offered me a job and I caught a few breaks and Boom. somehow I'm down here at Al coaching Boom. coaching where you played and coached. That's amazing. You know, Nate, I uh, I can remember when I worked for Jim Herrick and I was at UCLA way back you know, from 88 to 95, and we talked all the time, but he was nine years at Morningside High School uh, here in Los Angeles, and he had really, really good teams, and he ended up uh, towards the end there with one really good player that was getting highly recruited, and that was kind of his, you know, into the college, but he always would say to me, high school basketball is where he really learned how to coach. You know, he, he was able to you know, coach and develop a philosophy and make mistakes and, you know, just really learn how to coach. And, uh, you know, I never did that. I was never in high school. You know, I started as a graduate assistant and boom, you know, I'm on that track. But for you, I've got to imagine or, or possibly was, was that a great learning opportunity for you as far as kind of preparing you to coach and, and then how you've become such a great coach. Did the high school years help you? No, I, for sure. I've thought about this a lot. And I, you know, my route wasn't very conventional, but I wouldn't really trade it for anything because, you know, similar to what Coach Eric was talking about, like like you're able to experiment. Like, I, you know, one year we press – you're out there in California, a guy by the name of Vance Wahlberg, mm -hmm. who's now the head coach at Fresno. You know, he was at Fres Fresno City College at the time, and they are putting up a bunch of points. I, I got in touch with him. He sent out some – DVDs. He got the job at Pepperdine. I flew out, me and my assistant, Josh Baker, who was with me for nine years at Romulus. He actually came down here with me to Alabama too, but we used to go to an NBA training camp or like a college somewhere. And a lot of years we tried to do both. That was kind of back when NBA started the last weekend in September, first weekend in October, and colleges didn't start till October 15th. So we would try to hit one of each. But one year we went out for five days to Pepperdine, Vance's first year and kind of learned his whole system. We'd been trending that way with opening the floor up and kind of the dribble drive. And But we pressed for the first, shoot, I don't know, 16 games that year. And, mm. you know, I kind of found what worked, what didn't work. Mm. I have gone away from it. I haven't really done it <laughs> since. We did a little bit of it this year at Alabama. But, you know, you, you're, you're, not, you're not able to experiment with that many things in college because there's a big spotlight on you. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of questioning going on. Mm -hmm. you, you try to experiment with something and it doesn't work. You, mm -hmm. sure, we were at 500. We were eight and eight. That was the worst we'd been, you know, at Romulus after 16 games. And I kind of found out you can't really open the floor up against really good guards with mm -hmm. pressing, or you're gonna, yep. you know, we lost a bunch of close games. But you know, I wasn't as good at coaching it probably or teaching it as Vance was. But I, I you know, you kind of. You're able to develop a philosophy, like Coach Eric said to you, and I think that's for sure true. And even how we play here, we tweak it every year. But the general premise of it mm -hmm. was really formed back at Romulus when I when I was back there. You know, when I when I watch your teams, uh, Coach, which I, I've watched them a lot, obviously, and uh, you know, I was a pretty good shooter. I was okay. I could make a three here and there. I think there's a few records I still hold at Alabama, but. Uh, I often tell people in my friends and my buddies that I played with way back when, you know, man, I'd have loved it. You know, I love playing for Coach Sanderson. Don't get me wrong. I, I loved Wimp. He was so good to me and our teams were so good. But, you know, the way that you guys play and the way that you spread the floor and uh, one extra pass, one more pass, and boom, you guys, uh, you get a lot of shots. But I think your players, um, they develop so much confidence because I think you instill confidence in them. And it's the system, and you recruit to that a little bit, I'm sure. You're hunting for, for great shooters. But have you always kind of utilized the three-point shot the way you're doing it now? You know what? It's probably not quite to this extent. I mean, there's games when we shoot almost 53s now. Mm -hmm. That's, that would be unheard <laughs> of back when I first started. They'd probably fire you on the spot back when I first started <laughs> coaching. But the uh, – I. I didn't have the green light per se. I, I felt like I worked. I, I I was a gym rat. I was in the gym all the time. There were some shooters on, on my team that made, that shot it better than I did. But, you know, I, I didn't like the fact that only like one or two guys were able to really kind of shoot the ball in the system. I think that's a lot easier to guard when everything's predicated on one or two guys. So I, at Romulus, I got there. We had athletes everywhere and me and, 
Josh, my assistant, we just shoot. When I got there, they had zero shooting machines and we didn't, I, I'm trying to think, I think the score to the first, the first year we lost in the district semifinals. And I think it was like 42 to 38. I, or it might've been 38, 32. It was awful. We scored in the thirties. I said, we're never doing this again. So we, I went out and fundraised some money. We bought one shooting machine, one of the guns. And by the time I left, I left with, I left them with six shooting machines. We have them on all six rims and we're going to develop shooters. And the thing is the guys are not going to work on their shot if they can't shoot them in the games. That's right. That's so like, why are we going to be in the gym at 6 a.m. before school, after school on the weekends, doing all this skill development and then telling them you're not allowed to use the skills we're working on in the gym all the time in the game like that, that they quit working and, and we'd stink. Mm -hmm. So we got in the gym, we worked and then, Shoot, I think it's worked well. I mean, we, you know, our kid Jaron Stevenson this year mm -hmm. was hovering right around 30%. He was like high 20s most mm -hmm. of the year, which isn't a great percentage. Shoot, he went five of eight against Clemson, the That's biggest right. game of the year to send us to the final four. Like, and we've got numerous instances that you just keep pumping kids full of confidence. Yeah. As long as they're working mm -hmm. and they're taking good shots, mm -hmm. I'm not ever going to tell a kid not to take an open three. To me, that's absurd. Mm. You guys have done such a great job. You know, uh, Nate, in 1987, I was playing at Alabama, and it was the first year of the three-point line. So that was the uh, the inaugural year, college basketball. The ACC, remember, they screwed around and, and uh, experimented with that line that was inside the top of the key. It was way too short. But, you know, in 87, uh, nationally, they put it in, and we get to the Sweet 16. We were a two-seed, and Rick Patino was at Providence with Billy Donovan, Delray Brooks, that whole crowd. And I always that felt like – Huh? Those That's were right. the guys that were on, <laughs> yeah, that were on the coaching video that I bought in ninth grade. That's right. And so, uh, I always thought that Rick, after the game, I didn't know it, and he and I have talked about it, uh, Rick Patino. But they were, in my view, he was just kind of a step ahead of the game. He was in, he was utilizing the three point shot in year one, where most of the country really wasn't just yet. You know, coaches really didn't know how to utilize at the dribble drive and penetrate and pitch and drive the baseline and throw the hammer pass to the other corner. I mean, nobody was doing that. Nobody. And, I, and all right. of a sudden here comes uh, and they make it to the final I, four. It's amazing. I would love, I love to see how many threes they took. It's actually, that'd be good, something good to look up because he was ahead of the game yep. and I bet they hardly took any compared to what no everybody's doing now. You know, like I'm sure there were plenty of games back there where teams took zero, uh, you know, like, Guy, they didn't take them it was all in the post and yeah well, you know one, one thing too Nate I think you've done a great job with and, and again I, I love how your team is playing but you know as I, I was in the games in Los Angeles this year in your sweet 16 and elite eight game and then obviously you know at the final four in Phoenix but um, you know I kept telling people I said when you guard Alabama you better pick them up quick and, and get your defense back in transition because they'll pull it in transition if it's the right guys that they're in the flow. And I'm sure you guys have confidence in certain players, but it puts so much pressure on the defense to get back. And then when you're getting back, you're getting back in transition defense, but your defense is so spread to the three point line that now it creates opportunities for guys to, you know, maybe get to the rim. So, um, you know, people are utilizing the three, but Nate, I, I think you guys have done as good a job as anybody in the country with it. And you're recruiting to it, obviously. You're getting guys that can make shots. If you've got a team full of guys that can't make them, you're in deep trouble. But you've done a good job there. But kind of that in transition, to me, it's a fun part of the game just for a fan. I'm a fan now, so I'm just, you know, I'm rooting. But I like it because it puts so much pressure on the defense in transition. No, it does. And, and if you look, and we've done the studies on it, and we chart it, we, we've, we've got what we call an analytics box score. Like everybody knows what box score is, but we've got like a way, way deeper one. And we, we chart when we get our first shot up, you know, whether it's the first six seconds of the shot clock, the second six, the third six. And our now it's not every game, but if you look over the course of the year, the most efficient part of the shot clock is the first six seconds. Now, a lot of times you can't get a good shot in the first mm -hmm. six, but if you can shoot, like I, I tell our guys an open three is an open three. I don't care whether it's three seconds off the clock or 23 <laughs> seconds off the clock. It doesn't like if you're a good shooter and you're open from three, shoot it. 
And there's numerous times where, you know, we you now, especially with the transfer portal, they're used to playing in a system where they walk it up. It's very slow. If you haven't gotten it in the post, you better not shoot a three. So we'll pass up an open three and five, 10 seconds later, you turn the ball over. I'm like, like, we had even it. if you miss the three, <laughs> we had like you, you got a chance for an old boy. There's like, I, I, we, I, I've already been through this with our guys. We have one week expected value on a shot. Like what's the expected value? Like you may miss it. We may get zero this possession, but if the expected value on that shot is 1.2, like we're good. Yeah. Like we're going to win yep. 90% of the games. If we get all of our shots with a 1.2 or higher expected value, you're a 40% shooter and you take a three, the expected values. 1.2, whether there's three seconds off the clock or 23. Mm. So we're we're taking it with three seconds off the clock. Oh. And, and it's fun. Like you said, you're oh. a fan and you've been in basketball your whole life. I love it's, it. We're, we're packing Coleman out. I, it's, it, I'm sure it was packed out when you were there because there was yeah. there was a lot of pros on those teams when you were yep. back here with yep. Wim. Yeah. But yep. we're starting to get we're starting to get a lot of pros back here again now. No, it's been amazing. And so since you're talking about the three-point shot, so my first thought is I'm going to start stretching. I'm going to get loose. I'm going to get back in shape and see if I got any eligibility left. And if I do, I can sneak back in there. And, you know, you can disguise me a little bit, Coach. I know I got gray here, but <laughs> see if you can get me in the game. I'll make a couple for you here and there. Uh, I can't, I can't guard funny, anybody, actually. Coach. I, I can't guard anybody, but I can shoot a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's it. Look, while we've been on this, I actually pulled up the uh, box score to that to that nineteen eighty seven game. Do, How many did they you, shoot? Uh, How got, many did Providence shoot? Got, did, did they create they twenty, which is a lot for back then. I mean, shoot, there's teams that don't even shoot twenty today. Right. But you you know how many you know how many you know any Alabama shot? How many? 23 you shot nine of them yourself you're four or nine not bad you could you could have played for us mark four, I got four or nine we'll take it i got eligibility four. somewhere i got some eligibility 40, left 24 percent, man we'll take it come on that's funny all right coach so you're at romulus high school you're you're plugging along you've had this great run and here comes an opportunity for you to get into college and uh if i have it right i think you that's when you headed to buffalo with bobby hurley is that correct correct yeah, yeah, yep, you got it. How was that? Kind of like How? Jim Merrick. So, it was, you know, they. I got to know the hurt. Well, first way I got to know him, I told you, we used to try to go out to like a NBA training camp or a college. So the, the one year Danny Hurley went from Wagner, or sorry, went from St. Benedict's to Wagner, I said to Josh, my assistant, let's, let's try to go to Wagner. Let's figure out when Bob Hurley Sr. is going to be out there watching Danny. So I call Wagner's office. I said, you know, let's try to learn from Danny. Bob Sr., Hall of Fame coach. So I call the Wagner offices and Bobby Hurley answers. Like, there's no secretary. It's just Bobby Hurley. Like, you know, this is the guy I'm watching. He's Final Four most outstanding player when I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, hey, Bob. So I explained to him, you know, you first have to let him know, hey, by the way, we have some players. Here's some guy, you know, like, because they don't want to pay any attention to you if you don't have any players, as you know. So I, I get out the fact that we've got players here at Romulus. We had 18 kids go play Division One when I was there. So we, so we start, you know, I get a cell phone, we trade back and forth. We never figured out when to get to Wagner, when Bob Sr., so we didn't do it. But he hits out of the park at Wagner, they go to Rhode Island. Rhode Island had a guy named Preston Murphy, who's Ooh. my assistant now, mm. from Michigan that was recruiting my kid E.C. Matthews. So he probably wasn't going to Rhode Island until Hurley got there. Well, Hurley's picked up the recruitment. Preston kept recruiting him. The kid ends up committing there. Danny is he's a top 100 kid first one Danny ever got committed and before he even coached a game there so they came out a lot to watch us practice work out kid ended up being a 2,000 point score there and kind of through that whole process I got to know Bobby and Danny pretty well and Bobby ends up getting a head job and and look, kind of like you said like I, you know Danny knew Danny had been a high school and, and it was I would like I said I caught a lot of breaks like there's lots of good high school coaches that just don't catch a break. But I think the Hurley's respected high school coaches a lot more mm -hmm. than what a typical college would, coach would. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Bobby had never been a head coach. I had, had 11 years coaching experience. Bobby hired me as his top assistant, which I'm super grateful for. You know, I wouldn't be here where I'm not if it wasn't for Bob. And, you know, so, I, you know, I've stayed in touch with him. And then obviously with Danny too, we played them in the final four this year, which is, you know, we played them last year out of the PK85 deal, but 
you know, and then I, and one of the things I, you know, when I got to Romulus, I, at that, when I first took the job, I would have gone anywhere in the country to be a division one assistant, full-time mm-hmm. basketball. Like I'm all in mm-hmm. anywhere. Well, as the years went on and I got to know more and more division one coaches and, you know, you see guys get fired after a year or two and they got to move their families. And I had three daughters and I'm like, I'd got to the point, like, I'm not getting into division one and really Bob Hurley senior kind of helped me without ever really talking to him. This guy's that successful, stayed in high school, turned down Division One head jobs. I, I was a lot more picky with where I was going to go. Like, if they weren't going to win, the only way I wanted to have to move was if we move up, not get fired and have to. Mm-hmm. So I got a little pickier. Well, I kind of felt pretty confident in the Hurley family in basketball. They, they seem to know what they're doing. I think they've proven that. Mm. So when Bob offered me the job, I was all in. So mm-hmm. – after 11 years and we won the state championship that year in 2013, I took the job and I was accurate in my prediction that the Hurleys would know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Bob makes the NCAA tournament in his second year. You know, we're there for two years and Buffalo makes the first NCAA tournament ever in the history of the school. And he gets the Arizona State job. And then, ironically enough, Danny White, who's now the head, the AD at Tennessee, was the AD at Buffalo at the time. His, uh, uh, he ended up hiring me after only mm. two years being a assistant at Buffalo. And shoot, like I said, I caught a break with the Hurleys. I caught a break with Danny White. Mm-hmm. Caught a break with some of the players we got at Buffalo. And I caught a break with some of the players that were left here. I mean, look, you know, Avery Johnson had some pretty good talent that he brought in when he was here. If, you know, if they hadn't left Her- Herb Jones as SEC player of the year, I didn't recruit Herb. Mm-hmm. Like, I was fortunate to coach mm-hmm. him for two years. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I've – Definitely caught some breaks in the coaching world on my way to where we've gotten this program now, for sure. Well, you've you've caught breaks, but you've just done a great job too. I mean, we you got to still take advantage of him, and you did. And <clears throat> you had a great run at Buffalo, and uh, you know how now you got Alabama. And I, and I often say this, and I don't, you know, one thing I always say is, as a coach who coached for thirty three years, coaching is hard. And uh, and I don't, I I'm so cautious to ever criticize a coach I, it just bothers me because I know how hard it is everything that goes into the job but you know when you came to Alabama and obviously we're all watching from a distance but I and I'm not knocking anybody because everybody was good in their own right but I think it was a great time for you you know Alabama had and, and you know when I was there coaching as a head coach we had some great runs you know obviously we we, we did some things but the program had dipped a little bit and I think there was a little you know, the, the, the fans and the people around Alabama were, they were dying for something, you know, to win a little bit more than they had. And, I, and I'm not trying to be critical, but uh, it was great timing for you. And then you just kind of breathed a bunch of life back into the program and you just did an amazing job with that. And so, you know, that, that, that journey from Buffalo, here you come to Alabama a little bit different now, a little bit, you know, the spotlight's on you. The spotlight's a little brighter when you get in the SEC or the ACC or the Big Ten. Here you come. Tell me about kind of what was that like for you? I mean, yeah, I'd never lived in the South before. So, I, you know, I born and raised in Wisconsin, moved to Detroit for 11 years, moved to Buffalo for six. So I was up north my whole life, and I came here. And, like, I, I love it. The I mean, you're from here. You know, you've, you're from – way down on the, on the Gulf, like <laughs> where, where we all go for vacation. Uh, that's uh, you, you, you you, you grew up in vacation land, but I mean, the people here are super friendly mm-hmm. there. And look, they're really passionate about college athletics. There's no professional sports teams in Alabama. Mm-hmm. And, and there's, you know, it better than anybody. There's a group of a strong group of basketball supporting people at Alabama. And kind of like you said, they just, kind of been dormant, a little quiet for a while. I mean, you know, shoot, <laughs> you know, I hate to say it, but you, you, you haven't been here for a while. We were selling some of your team's success <laughs> on our recruiting PowerPoints when we first, like, no, it, it is possible for Alabama basketball to be really good. They, they made back to back to back, back mm-hmm. to sweet 16s in the mm-hmm. day. You know, mm-hmm. you took the team the furthest had ever been to that elite eight with Petway's group. You guys, you guys were rated number one in the country. Uh, the one year there. So th- th- it's proven you can win here. It just, it's been a little dormant for, for mm-hmm. a while. Mm-hmm. So we got in and a lot of people get in and say, when, when I get the talent, we're going to play a certain way. Like, 
it happens with recruiting all the time. You know, they'll kid will be like, oh, well, they're going to play this way. I'm like, did you just look at the way they played? Well, when they get, you know, if I get there, they're going to, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. And then it never <laughs> happens. Well, we just came in right away and put in, look, the roster did not fit the way mm-hmm. we wanted to play. Right. I mean, half the roster was bigs, traditional bigs. And we just said, forget, like, we're putting our system in. This is how we play. We're going to play fast. We're going to take threes. We're going to spread it out, uh, whether we have the right guys for Now, we had some guys that fit it. Obviously, John Petty, leading three-point shooter in Alabama history, by the time he finished with us. You know, he was here. Kyra Lewis was good for mm-hmm. the system. There was mm-hmm. some. We just – Kyra's playing, like, almost 40 minutes a game because mm-hmm. there's no depth in the backcourt. And, but we put the system in right out of the gate. So mm-hmm. then we're selling recruits. No – and we finished one game over 500 our first year. We didn't have the correct roster to play that way, but we put it in, sold it to recruits. Year two, we win the SEC regular season and tournament, and now we're rolling. Like yep. everybody sees, yep. this is the way we want to play. We've got multiple guys drafted. Guys are playing well in the NBA. So, And, and I think it's it's a, a modern way of playing. It's the way the NBA plays. And mm-hmm. we, shoot, I've been hiring mm-hmm. assistants out of the NBA. You know, Charlie Henry was mm-hmm. with me all four years. Mm-hmm. The first four, he, he came out of the NBA, and Ryan Pannone was came mm-hmm. out of the Pelicans. I've, mm-hmm. We're trying to run an NBA system as mm-hmm. as close as you can. The rules right. are different; you can't quite, but as close as you can in the college, which I think helps with recruiting. And it, shoot, mm-hmm. to be honest with you, every NBA team has an analytics department, and they're they're playing this way because it's the most efficient way to play basketball. Mm-hmm. We're playing this way because it's the most efficient way to play mm-hmm. basketball. Mm-hmm. It also happens to be the way, the way the NBA plays, and it gets your players better for the NBA, mm-hmm. you know, more so than in a traditional college system would. Yeah, and and I think it, it it draws more. If I'm a great shooter, I'm putting you at the top of my list. If I'm a high school kid or in the portal or a transfer or, you know, the way that you guys play. So let me ask you this one, Nate, because for me – Wait, you Nate. Know, hmm? The way the NCAA is making the rules, like I think you might have another year left. The way they just came out with a new rule. Like, we, I don't know. hey, I'm I'm just hoping that 2.7 billion they just settled with. I'm hoping it goes all the way back to 87, where I can get some <laughs> let's get some cash. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was there 11 years as the head coach, and and I loved it. It was wonderful, but probably for me. Uh, in those last couple, two or three years, you know, we had been ranked number one, gotten the Elite Eight, and uh, we had five head football coaches in 11 years. It's amazing. Five guys. They rolled through five head coaches. But anyway, I got real frustrated, Nate, because I, I know Alabama, they love football, and they always will, and it's, it's kind of a – it's part of the fabric of, of the state, you know, Alabama-Auburn football. But – Basketball is big, too, and you've done a great job. Bruce, obviously, there. When I, I was the head coach, Cliff Ellis was there, and he was just rolling. But uh, how have you kind of taken the, the enormity of football in that state um, and maybe used it to your advantage, or um, how have you kind of adapted to that? Because it is different. It's just different. It's the way of life, and it just – you and I, as much as we love basketball, we may never change it. Doesn't mean it's not a great, great job like you've done, but it's definitely different. So, how, how have you dealt with that? You know what? I, it's actually a really good question because when when I got here initially, people really tried to use it against us mm-hmm. in recruiting I, to football school, and and you know what it is like. Mm-hmm. I, I <laughs> like to say it's not would be kind of absurd, like. You know, I remember we had a staff meeting once when I, you know, early in my years, and one of the guys on staff kind of brought up what football is able to do. I was like, yeah, you know what? We're only 18 national championships behind them. <laughs> They're going to be able to do some stuff. <laughs> we, we got we got some catch-up to do here, fellas. <laughs> so, but, I, but I, I tried to spin it. In a way, like, first off, if you understand, and you do, because you've been in college athletics your whole life, if you understand how college athletics works, and people are starting to see it in a big way right now with all the money, like like the settlement you just talked, the biggest money maker in college athletics right now is football. Mm-hmm. It's not even close. Okay, we are at a, in my opinion, we've got the best football program over the history of college football mm-hmm. in the country. Mm-hmm. It brings in a lot of money. Mm-hmm. The money is used in the entire athletic department, including men's basketball. Mm-hmm. So 
I, I've sold to these guys. Like we've got the resources here to win at the highest level. So if you understand college athletics, it, it's actually a positive to be at a football school because some of these schools that are not football schools are going to struggle financially moving forward with what's going on. And this was even when I, you know, I've been here five years, five years ago, I tried to make this point to some of these recruits, like you're going to have be better facilities. We're going to travel better. The nutrition's better. Like just go down the list of everything mm -hmm. that's going to be better because we got better resources for you here. Now, you know, maybe our, Jim's not packed every day like it is at some of these blue bloods. But if we start, it is now that we're winning. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to sell a vision back then. And now you see it like, no, we're actually better off being at Alabama than you would be at maybe some traditional basketball powerhouse that doesn't necessarily have the the financial backing that mm -hmm. we would here at Alabama just mm -hmm. because we football is such a big deal. Mm -hmm. And you know, you use football games for recruiting. There's mm -hmm. nothing early. We had, and I told our staff this too, guys. We can't burn up official visits with these guys that just want to come to an Alabama football mm -hmm. game that we have no chance to get. Mm -hmm. Because that, that, as you know, that that mm -hmm. there's plenty of that out there. Oh yeah. I said we better make sure this kid actually wants to visit Alabama because he's actually thinking about going to Alabama basketball, mm -hmm. not just because he wants to see a football game here. Now though. We've got basketball going. We have the best football atmosphere in the country, mm -hmm. in my you would know, mm -hmm. you know, better. So I think for recruiting, for a lot of different reasons, it's great to be at a school that has a great football tradition. Now, somebody mm -hmm. asked me this right after winning a basketball championship, and I just said we're a championship school. Yeah. Which is true too. We've got six different sports that won oh, a national yeah. championship oh, here. Yeah. We we have not won yet in basketball, but but we're we're gonna be knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. So I think they support athletics in a big enough way that mm -hmm. you can win championships. Mm -hmm. If they have the sport here at Alabama, you ought to be competing for a national championship, in my opinion. You know, Nate, that's a great, great answer. You know, I, you know, my last probably year and a half was, was with Nick Saban, and uh, they had just hired him. And uh, I think that first year he struggled. I can't remember his record, but they, they, weren't, they didn't have the talent, obviously, that they, he ended up with later. Louisiana Monroe, That's right? It. Was I that remember. The year that they, yeah. 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 And I was there and, you know, and, and Nick was, uh, <clears throat> you know, he was a different breed cause you know, you talk about putting blinders on now and you know, he, he wanted to coach the team and he didn't want to do all the speaking and all the boosters and blah, blah, blah. And he just locked in. But you know, my, my interactions or my crossover there was, was brief, maybe a year and a half, but I, I was around him a lot. And, and I saw him operate, and uh, for a short amount of time, I learned so much. But then you've been, you know, there, and and um, when we talk about coaches, and you can talk about all sports, and obviously John Wooden's, and you know, there, there's some, you know, Nick Saban is he's up there, you know, he's in the Mount Rushmore with what he's done, you know, at LSU, and then obviously at Alabama and his career. But for you, are there some nuggets of you just observing him? And you're the basketball coach; he's a football coach, and you're just observing how he's operating, how he's building his program. Were there any takeaways for you, one or two, that just kind of jumped off the page? Yeah. So it's ironic you kind of talked about he came in with the blinders, and I got a story mm -hmm. for that in a minute, mm -hmm. but uh, which is dead, you know, it's true. So, you know, I think he's arguably, kind of like you said, arguably the best sport, best coach of any sport in modern sports history. I mean, he's won seven national championships, one at LSU and six here. So I, I when I got here, I, I wanted to take advantage of being at the same place as him. So I, I asked if I could come over and shadow him for a day, which I did. I went on the first road trip they ever took when I was here. They played Duke in Atlanta. I went on the the plane, watched everything, sat in meetings. You know, I've been to practices. I've been sat through. So I've tried to, and again, like you said, he's extremely – locked in. There's no waste. Mm -mm. He doesn't waste any time mm -mm. during the day. I mean, he, he's a machine. Like it's very regimented and he's extremely good at what he does. He's been great. You know, he met with recruits when it fit his schedule, which he made it fit his schedule often for us. But so the, the, the first day I chatted him from like first in the morning, all the way through, I, I called over there, said, Hey, you know, they checked with him. He said, yeah, no problem. So they start at 7.30. I show up like 7.15, getting a 
meeting room. I kind of follow them through the whole day. Like, I mean, it's, it's fall camp. Like they're, they're on, like it's bang, 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 bang. So finally, literally the first time he has a break is about five o'clock and it's like dinner. And he says, Hey, you know, he kind of waves at me. You want to come see me? He didn't really, hadn't said a word to me the whole day. I just kind of followed him every meeting he went to, I went to, I sat in the back of the room and he ran the D back thing. And, and I, he said, you, you know, do you got any questions for me? Or he said, do you have anything for me? And I said, well, if you're asking if I have suggestions, like, absolutely not. That's not why I'm here. And even if I did, I'm not going to give them to you. Like, and I did. I said, but if you're asking, do I have questions about how you do that? I said, yeah, I got plenty written down if you mind me throwing them out. So one of the questions I asked, I said, coach, like, how, you know, I got hired in uh, March and this is August. And I don't know how many different places they had me speak. I mean, you know how it is down mm -hmm. here. Like, yep. Light years different than Buffalo. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, my like, I think one of my last questions, I said, Coach, how do you manage coaching the team and doing all of these different speaking engagements that they ask you? Like, he goes, Coach, when they hired me, I told them they had nine days. That's it. Mm -hmm. Pick carefully. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do nine events. That That's it. That's all you get. So I'm like, okay, you know, I mowed that over. I went home that night, you know, that day ends at like 10 o'clock at night. I'm like, you know what? That's a great idea. I'm going to walk into Greg Byrne. I can't coach his team with the way they, they got me running around here. I said, I'm going to tell him he's got nine days. <laughs> so then I thought, and I slept on it, and I woke up the next morning. I was like, you know what? I don't have seven <laughs> national championships to my name or whatever he had at that point. I don't have this. They're paying me a lot of money. And yeah, I figured out why I have to speak because they either want the football coach or the basketball coach and they ain't getting the football coach. So guess who's got to go speak? I never had that conversation with Greg. I just went and kept speaking and earned my money. But now that we made a final four, maybe I can uh, back it up. Go in and tell him he's got nine days. Back it up a bit. So, when he first yeah. got the job, uh, Nate, it was funny. They, they used to do the, uh, I think it was called the uh, quarterback or I can't remember the name of the club. They met right across the street at the Sheraton or the Capstone Hotel and there was an old guy, it was a wonderful old guy named Harry Lee, and he was, I think, the president of the A Club. And he, he kept calling me, he said, Mark, can you talk Coach Saban into walking across to speak for us? I said, I'm not touching it, Harry. I'm not touching it. <laughs> You'll get him whenever he wants to come. But, uh, well, he was just, he's just such a – I'm glad that you've had such a good relationship, and I've watched you guys interact. And Terry was always so nice to me and my children, and so it, it was it was wonderful. So – Coach, we're in a new era now. This is a new new era for all of us. And uh, you've got the portal now where, you know, kids are can obviously move around year to year. You've got the NIL, which is uh, where, you know, and I'm all for it. I think I'm glad that players can receive compensation, finally get paid a little bit. I think the NCAA ought to be paying them. That, that's been my biggest beef from the start leaning on everybody else to come up with the money and they should be coming up with the money. And uh, I've said it out loud way too many times, but so in your world, how do you see that changing? Obviously there's a ton of changes, but the impact and seems like you've tried to utilize all those things to your benefit, but talk to me a little bit about your thoughts with all that NIL portal. It's different now than it was 10 years, you know, maybe when you were at Buffalo completely different now. So Give me your thoughts. I mean, none of it was here even five years ago when I started. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole industry's changed since I've got to Alabama. So, look, I, a lot of people complain about about it. Here's my thing: change is inevitable. Mm -hmm. You better figure out how to how to deal with it. I I don't think it's that bad to be honest. Mm -hmm. I okay, the NIL thing and the paying the players. Who's going to pay? Who's going to they need to get it figured out because right. it's a little bit mm -hmm. disjointed. The collectives pop like somebody, and it's probably going to take Congress get involved to actually get it all completely figured out. Somebody needs to figure that out. But with the transfer deal, look, I everybody can complain all they want. It's here. It's not changing. It's not going back, and it's not the worst thing because before, like before, if you recruited a kid in you were kind of stuck with them for four years, whether he's a great fit or not. A lot of times they could transfer down or whatever city year if it got bad enough. Mm -hmm. But it, it it was so rare that you, I'm sure you almost felt bad if you kind of tried to mm -hmm. run a kid. Oh, mm -hmm. Well, now if the kid's not going to play much, 
win win. <laughs> good for him. Good for us. Good for, good for everybody. <laughs> yeah. like we need we need a spot freed up, and they go and he, he goes somewhere where he's going to play, and we can recruit somebody in that's going to fit a little better. And I mean, nobody's a hundred percent recruiting. They're not a hundred percent in the NBA. Like they're mm -hmm. not, and they got staffs of. 20, 30 people trying to figure out who to draft. Mm -hmm. Like, so you're going to make some mistakes. You can quickly, you know, kind of remedy yourself from it. You can put together a roster like, like you want every year. The, the, now, when they came out with the rule and whatever it was, January, you know, where everybody was going to be able to transfer every year, I, I kind of said to our staff, mm -hmm. like, guys, we're, we're recruiting 13 roster spots every year mm -hmm. now. Mm-hmm. They're all 13 are open. The good thing is that we've got kids that are in our building every day mm -hmm. that we want back here. Like we can recruit them right now. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean I'm not going to coach them hard because if I actually care about their future, mm -hmm. there's some tough love that has to happen, but we ought to be building the relationships anyways. And if we want the kids that we currently have on our roster, even if we don't think that they're going to stay because it's not working, they're not, but you still treat them right. And then mm -hmm. you just help them get to the right next mm -hmm. spot the correct way. So I think it's, I think it's harder for coaches that don't treat their kids well now because they can't keep them word gets out. So it's just got some added good pressure, if you will, like do the right thing, treat, treat your kids. Well, mm -hmm. if you treat them well and they're getting better, you know, most of the time they don't want to leave if they're good enough to play for you, you know, and if word gets out that you're going to get better and you're going to, you know, be treated the way you should be treated, like it's a little easier to recruit kids to come to you mm -hmm. out of the transfer portal. So I think we've been, shoot, you look at our roster right mm -hmm. now, what we were able to do in the transfer portal, it helped go into a Final Four, but I think the style of play that we play with, mm -hmm. the way that our kids get treated here, I think there's a lot that, you know, I I think we've adapted pretty well and whatever rules they continue to yep. change, you figure out what they are and you, and you, and you go with it. You know, Nate, I, I would tell you this, and I talk to coaches all the time. I've, I've had, you know, uh, Mick Cronin on the show and Eric Musselman, both the guys out here in the West. And, you know, and, 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 uh, and not those guys, they, they've kind of adapt. Everybody's adapting. That's part of it. But um, your answer to that and the way you're approaching it, I think, is probably the best I've heard. In other words, you know, all the things you just said, because uh, it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. And uh, you got to use it to your advantage, which you guys have done. And, uh, you know, I look at like a guy like Mark Sears who played for you this year. And, Nate, I go back, uh, you know, I was a year and a half. I was scouting for Dallas, and that's the year we drafted Luka and we drafted Jalen Brunson. And I was so high on Jalen all year long. I kept telling everybody, I'm not sure. And I didn't think he was as good as he is now. I'm, I didn't – I'm going to be honest with that one. But – I loved him. I just kept saying, I just don't think he'll fail. That's what I kept telling him in every meeting. I don't think he'll fail. He, he's, he, you, don't, you look at him and you say, well, I, I don't know if he can guard anybody, but no one gets by him. Then he gets by everybody. He makes every tough shot. He's a leader. He's a competitor. But when I watch Mark Sears for you, I tell people he reminds me of him. Now, I don't know, I'm not trying to put pressure on Mark Sears that he can be what Jalen Brunson is now because – He's taken off to a whole nother level with the New York Knicks. But I love the way you utilize his game. I love the confidence that he has. Um, you know, the, his ability to penetrate and find guys, you know, on the other side of the floor or even throw, throw the passes that come back towards the top of the key or getting all the way to the rim to the score. He makes threes. He makes deep threes. So it had to be – Great. I mean, I, I, you know, you want the best for your guys. If he would have stayed in the draft and been a high pick, you'd have been happy as ever. But to have him back, I'm assuming that's got to just be kind of that uh, yeah. because it just gives you some that seasoned veteran guy that has the ball in his hands a lot. No, it does. I mean, it was huge that he came back. And you know what? If he would have been a, you know, guaranteed real NBA contract, not a two way, we'd have been super happy for him. Mm -hmm. He's graduated college. He's from. Muscle Shoals. He, I, to me, he's like, what's good about the transfer portal, right? Mm -hmm. the, you know, we missed on him coming out. He's a kid from Muscle Shoals. We didn't think he was good enough coming out of high school. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we were wrong, but you know what? Everybody else in the country was wrong too. <laughs> so he goes to Ohio, and maybe he wasn't quite good enough then. I don't know. We maybe we were wrong. Maybe he just got that much better. But he goes to Ohio and proves he's pretty dang good college basketball player, mm -hmm. and. 
we take him. People still questioning, can he do it at this level? Well, he was pretty good. We were the number one mm -hmm. overall seed in the NCAA tournament. He was our second leading scorer behind Brandon Miller's who turned out to be a pretty good NBA player. So mm -hmm. this year, you know, he averages over 20 and is our leading scorer, and we make the Final Four. Mm -hmm. And he's able to come back, you know, with NIL. He's, you know, able to make good money. You know, it, it, it's, college, it's good for college because now a kid – he actually can become the face of without a doubt. Yep. I don't know if you want to say the face of college basketball. Yep. That might be a little strong, but one of the faces of yep. college basketball this year, mm -hmm. and for sure he's the face of Alabama yep. basketball, being mm -hmm. from the state, the leading scorer. So he should be able to make money off his name, image, and likeness. That that's what this was mm -hmm. for, to the point where he can come back to college and not have to go play in the G League if he doesn't want. So I think it's big. I think. You know, he's going to make another – every year he's been in college, he's made a jump. He didn't shoot it well his freshman year. He shot it well his sophomore year. Then he jumps to the SEC. Then he makes another big – he's going to make another big jump. And I think that's his defense, his leadership, stuff. you know, like making the right reads. And he's – not that he's bad at any of that stuff, but he's made jumps. So now he's gotten all the NBA feedback. This is what you need to make it at this level. I think he's a kid that's going to mm -hmm. digest all that and make the jump he needs to and hopefully another year with us and he gets drafted and plays a long time in the NBA because he, he's a really talented player that works his tail off yep. you know, to, uh, to be a good player. I think he will, Nate. I really do. I've told guys in the NBA, the guys that I know well, I said I wouldn't count him out. He's just one of those guys. He just somehow – you just Look, if you had something to do with drafting Luka and Brunson in the same draft, <laughs> yeah, they – they... They should they should ask your opinion a little more if, if, if that was if that was your doing there in Dallas. That, dude, Luke, Luke is absurd, and Jalen Brunson. I mean, it, Matt, now they've got Luke and Kyrie, who's pretty good. But yeah. can you imagine Luke and Brunson. I guess pretty, you wouldn't have bad. Kyrie if you had. Not bad. You know, yeah, I go back and and some of my guys I had Kennedy Winston was a great player way back in the early two thousands. Rod Grizzard, but be, if there if NIL was around then. Those guys probably would have stayed, just like a couple of your guys. They probably would have stayed, and they felt like they, you know, wanted to make the jump, maybe make some money. So that's just such a great point. So, well, Nate, I, I'm I'm thrilled, man, for you. And um, you know, uh, the alumni like me, we're watching, we're watching. The alumni. <laughs> it's been great to get you back. By the way, talk a little, a little bit of Alabama. I mean, you've been back a few times. They've honored your teams, and I think it's great. So. I know it's hard to pry you out from the West Coast. It looks like you've seen a little sun out there. You, I, don't, I don't think that's from the tanning bed in your house. I, I think you're enjoying the weather out there in California. No, it's so. great. And I and I love coming back. And uh, I'll be back, I think, for the opening football game. So I hope to run into you. But, man, I just want to tell you thank you for coming on. And, you know, uh, my era of guys, when we were at the Final Four, Nate, and uh, this was kind of a fun thing. You would have had no idea this happened. But, you know, all of our tickets were in the, the section, the Alabama fans section. And, well, you know, we've got, you know, Herb was there, Herb Jones, and uh, a little guard, I can't remember his name, that was in between you and I, I believe. But then a lot of guys from my era, the Chuck Davises and Emmett Thomas, and, and uh, we had probably, I don't know, 15, 18, Pet was there, Antoine Petway, but we're all kind of together. Well, in between the two games, we got together. We wanted to take a big picture, and we turned around, and the – entire Alabama section man there were cameras coming everywhere and and uh, they were so excited and uh, the fans were excited to be at the final four it was such a you know it was such a an amazing thing for you guys I was so happy for you guys and uh, you know I really believe Nate that if you just you know we all need a little luck you got to have a little luck in this game and and you kind of in my opinion ran into a little bad luck this year it's similar to when when my team went to the elite eight you know, we're facing UConn way back then, and um, they were the dominant best team in the country. We just we caught them in the Elite Eight, and you catch them in the Final Four, and they were good. I mean, they were just really good. And as good as you played, you were right there. You're right there, but um, they, they had a heck of a team. But you just need a little luck, um, and you got to be good. You've, you've obviously proven that, but Man, I believe that you can get there. I really do, and I and I'm hoping for you, and uh, I'm pulling for you, man. And we all are. And let's just keep getting, you know, one step at a time. And you kind of got that next step, and and now it's just one more step coming. So no, I'm rooting I for you. No, I appreciate it. We we feel like the people here in Alabama and the alumni are 
Poland Forest. Yeah. That, it's super cool that you, all those people came out to oh, the game at the Final Four. It was like, great. It was Pet, wonderful. Petway's great. Shoot, the best. I know Petway played for you and got a ton of respect for you, but best thing I did was keep him around. Oh. Like, I mean, he's, you know, I, I hope he does great at Kennesaw, but I told him, shoot, he's welcome. Come back here yeah. whenever he wants. I mean, he's Alabama through and through. So nice. I, I think he'll be good. But it, it, that, that's cool you got all those guys. I, I'm, I wasn't able to enjoy no. it. And it's interesting <laughs> you had Jay Wright. Jay Wright on the podcast, he was one of the guys I talked to that I've gotten to know, and he kind of told me, like, look, if you're there to win it, like, you got to kind of, like – Yeah, shut it down. Just don't Shut it down. Cut. Yeah, he, he the first time he was there, he said he let too many – Yeah. All the former, everybody in. and So that, I'm going to make you in charge of all the former. <laughs> look, next time we make it, here's Mark's cell phone number. Hey, he's in charge him. of the party. And, and he's in, <laughs> yeah. Him. Tickets, parties, everything. Call Godfrey. I, I got to try to worry about winning the game. Coach, that's all we want you to do is concentrate on winning the game. So, anyway, man, thank you for coming on the show. Um, again, man, we're all rooting for you. So, thank you, Nate. Appreciate you, Mark. Roll thank Tide. You. Roll Tide.